I'm excited. Clicking the button. Pulling up the notes. All right. We are going live. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. It is weekly scrap, 166. Ron Moore, he started his fire service career in 1968. He has served as a volunteer career from the lowest rank to the highest rank. He retired as a division chief out of McKinney, Texas. He has been heavily involved in training throughout his career and now operates a business to conduct vehicle rescue training programs across the country. He runs the University of Extrication website, which is a wealth of knowledge on the subject. And most of all, this is the most impressive thing. He is still passionate about the job. It is my pleasure to have Ron Moore on as the guest of Weekly Scrap number 166. Welcome, my brother. Thank you, Corley. I'm excited for this one. People are logging in. We're getting going. <laughs> Uh, is there anything I missed or anything I got wrong in the intro? I always like to offer that up so that my guests can correct me if I'm incorrect. No, uh, it, the, the, the newest topic and most demand topic is electric vehicles. So we will address electric vehicles kind of throughout the evening, but, but, uh, there aren't really any answers to the electric vehicle. It, that is really the evolving topic right now. So we, right we will address electric and, and autonomous vehicles um, and connected vehicles even as we go. I didn't even realize. Yeah. Craig D. Blake said more, more for the win. We got Corley Moore and Ron Moore. I know. In the Moore <laughs> Fire Department. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We got it going on. Uh, okay. Let's get the sponsors. Uh, let me see. Audience, everybody's logging in. Andrew McGinn said this, this is going to be good. I'm excited. Uh, this episode is brought to you by... Key Hose, check them out on Facebook, The Hose Experts. Speed Swivel, that is the solution for stolen, vandalized sprinkler and standpipe connections. Find out more at speedswivel.com. Affordable Drill Towers, firefighter owned and operated. The only thing that you can't do in an affordable drill tower is live fire. The Affordable Drill Tower, you can repel, stretch hose lines, go through the stairs, go through the floor, do window bailouts, cut holes in the roof props, Use the apartment balconies, pump the FDC, uh, flow water, call Steve, 844-55-TOWER, or drop an email to info at affordabledrilltowers.com. And as always, or, or sometimes I like to just highlight things that I love. I love Nextrung. And this one uh, is something I'm just putting a spotlight on in the scrap. Nextrung is something I believe in passionately. Uh, and so I always like to mention them or, or I, I want to mention them on this episode. So there's the housekeeping. I always want to mention the vigilantes, the private group you can belong to. Go to firehousevigilance.com if you want to be a part of it. It's exciting uh, and there's a lot going on there. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into the meat of the scrap. Number 166, Ron Moore. Um, I want to start with, uh, I don't know if it's an easy question, but we'll start with this question. You've been doing this a while. You've been passionate a while. And changes that you have witnessed throughout your fire service career. And it's a very broad question, so you can go any direction you want. Yeah, with there, it. There, there's two major areas: the vehicles themselves, the technology of the vehicles themselves have changed, and it's a challenge to keep up with that technology. But also, uh, uh, right along with that, our tools and our equipment and our techniques have changed as well. So it it really is comforting to see um, terms that years ago were not known by the fire service now they're they become the norm they're they're now in our blood so it's 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 nice to see that we're able to keep up with the evolving um cars and 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 tools and techniques no that is that is uh technology what's the thing you were most impressed on whether it be from the vehicles or our tools which one what what, what have you been most impressed with with the with the the vehicles themselves the biggest change that that kind of caused a ripple effect to us in the fire service was the the boron type steels the ultra high strength steels that really came about 2012 model year and 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 since then and now it's continuing to evolve so so the boron the ultra high strength steel when it first came out boron was a term that that the fire service really hadn't heard of and now that winds up being a term that i can use that in any class i teach and everybody recognizes it so i i like to see that the biggest change in in tools was the salesman said look at the change in cars your your tools rescue tools are older so you need to come up with newer equipment that's that's 
essentially boron capable if there is such a thing. And then uh, right along with the, the changes in the tools and the changes in the cars was changes in techniques. So I, that still is something that I, I would like to address that the fire service, fire rescue service, we have some good techniques, but we train on junkers and we rescue people out of brand new cars. Mm, so there's yes. a jet lag there that we really need to, as trainers, we really need to address. No, no, that's powerful. And so, uh, and you say everybody knows boron steel, but um, is it the structural elements, the just throughout the vehicle, like what the the, the pure strength of the boron steel? Where is yeah. that? Go ahead. Yeah, bor and boron is just one type. It's just like saying I made a Xerox copy, but right. you use a different copier. Just so, stronger or, steels. Right. Al ultra high strength UHSS is is really the term. Ultra high strength steel. So it, it, it became common uh, by 2017. We started to see some of the early efforts around 2020, uh, 20, even 2012 as, as early as that. And a lot of it is because the government now has ramped up their, their crash test standards. So one of the ways the manufacturers are addressing the crash worthiness so they can get that five star crash rating is by beefing up the the strength of the steel that is in key areas gotcha and that's what we're trying to overcome with our with the improved tools right right um and i i, I do not get me wrong i am i am not a rescue specialist at all so my ignorance i i'm just gonna throw the questions at you and let you run with them uh Glass. I heard that the glass is all going to be safety glass by, I don't know what year. Is that happened? Is that going to happen? Yeah. It's something all all of the glass in, in windows, side windows, rear window, uh, roof and, and, and uh, windshields, all of it is called safety glass, but the types of safety glass are the laminated, which is common to our windshield. And then the tempered that, that breaks into right. the small nuggets. What I've traditionally been, you know, you go pop it and boom, it turns into right. pellets, right? So, so there is a there is one of the re new requirements came out in 2017 from the federal government in North America is in a rollover situation, uh, essentially unbelted, unrestrained occupants need to be kept inside the vehicle. Well, one of the ways the manufacturer, dis several manufacturers, came up with dealing with that. Let's just laminate the side door window glass. So it it, it is possible now and and getting more and more common on late model vehicles 2017 let's say and newer to, for a firefighter to use a spring-loaded center punch or a sharp pointed object to punch a, a door window and all it does is crack it doesn't right. break into the nuggets so so the 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 thing about wind the, uh, the thing about laminated glass is different from windshields a windshield is is the same type of glass essentially but it's all glued in Laminated glass in, let's say, the driver's front door window is only secured at the bottom because the window has to go down to allow ventilation, allow the, 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 the door window to work. So for rescuers, we should not be stumped by laminated window glass in a side door. It'll be the driver's front door or passenger front door most likely. So if you hit it once with a spring-loaded center punch and it makes that little BB mark, you hit it again, okay, the second time I get the same BB mark. Now it's a miniature windshield. Use any tool or any technique that you all already are using for a windshield, but you only have to cut across the bottom. Okay. The, the top edge of the door. You only have to cut across the bottom of the window pane. Then you can pry that bottom out, pull it down, and the whole pane of glass it's a small windshield the whole pane of glass comes out because the sides and the top are not secured at all right on and and this is not a standard this is just a way that they've made it uh it's a, right it's an option to meet a requirement right 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 it's one okay. of the ways the another another uh, uh technology that is very very common now is roof airbags that deploy in rollover situations they come down deep enough to block the window. That's another technique to, to, that manufacturers come up with to try to keep unrestrained idiot uh, customer, our, the customers we're trying to serve, trying to keep the unrestrained uh, customer in, inside their vehicle. In a Just rollover. having less ejections on rollovers yeah, and, yeah. and bad wrecks. You know, actually, absolutely. the standard is ejection mitigation. 
they don't come up with a solution, but laminated glass is one possible solution. Roof airbags in rollover deployments rather than impacts is another solution. So there's a couple different techniques. If, if everybody was seat belted, belted and, 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 and drove at a normal speed, we wouldn't have near the problem. But life unfortunately, goes. people yeah. exist. Our job yeah. security exists because it, of the, it is job security. Yeah. The human factor. Absolutely. So okay. laminated glass should not be a stumbling block. It, it should don't look for it to be uh, uh, identified. It may be, but it may be black letters on, on in a dark situation. So just hit it with a punch. Go, go with it as if it's tempered. Hit it with a punch. It breaks into a little BB mark. Hit it again, another BB mark. And then just immediately reckon, <clears throat> recognize what you're dealing with and go with the removal and treat it like a, like a miniature windshield, like a miniature windshield. Exactly. I love that. Okay. That's, that's easy for even my firefighter brain to remember. All right. I'm going to catch you up uh, with people here. Stephen Bryant said, Ron listening in from Jordan, New York had Ron come to uh, scan Italy's for school bud rescue. When I was captain there, John K. Yes, Johnson. Ma- okay. Thank you. I, I was like, I'm butchering that. that. Yeah. Uh, John K. Johnson said, my man, Ron Moore. Thanks for your support. JJ. Uh, Nate Sturm said, love this topic. Thank you. Uh, Rick Huck said he and the late Billy Leach, two of the very best. Jaime Reyes out of Plano says Ron Moore, my man literally wrote the book on vehicle extrication. Proud to have learned so much from him over the years. Yeah. Jaime's a high up now in the, in the department, in the city where I live. So it's pretty cool. No, I'm proud to call him a good friend. So, uh, and Mike Cornelius senior said changed from a crowbar to the jaws of life in 1970. So <laughs> you got some old salty dogs in here talking already. So it's yeah, good I stuff. Guess. All the, right. The skinny Atlas school bus program is something that reminds me, uh, Corley, we should probably talk about the NFPA standards because um, NFPA, the, the standard that is most applicable to our whole overall topic is 1006. Right on. It, it's a, it's a technical rescue professional qualifications uh so so there the current edition is uh 2021 you okay. can access it free if 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 you don't want to pay for it if you're not a member you can you go to nfpa.org slash free access i think it is and you can come up with 1006 and, and read the document um chapter eight is is what they chapter eight and chapter nine is what we really are talking about based the standard off of what you're trying to meet yeah i mean there's there what they call chapters there's chapters on rope rescue and trench rescue and and all but eight is on common passenger vehicles and chapter nine is on what what nfpa calls heavy vehicle rescue Okay. So, hey, so and real it, quick, I don't want to break your flow, but if any of uh, the vigilantes can find a link and send it to me, I'll post a link to that. If you send, you can't post a link because of spammers and I can't allow them. But if you send me the message on Facebook, I'll post the link so that people that watch can click on it and go to NFPA, but go ahead, Ron. Sorry. So the, so the problem is as a trainer in, in a department, I want my, uh, what personnel do I want to be awareness operations and technician level qualified or competent as NFPA called. So I, I, as a trainer, uh, decided since it's not in the NFPA and it never will be, I decided for, for operate awareness is, is everybody. So operations level is what essentially all crew members of all departments, volunteer or career should be trained. Uh, Operations is, is, is skills. It talks about in NFPA, it talks about a car on four wheels. And then they have what they call technician level, which is a car, a, a, a common passenger vehicle, a car on its side or on its roof. So what what the problem was for trainers is what what qualifies as as a car, what qualifies as a heavy vehicle. So I arbitrarily said between chapter eight operations and technician and chapter nine, I went with 10,000 GVW. And just so, the gross vehicular uh, weight. Just straight it, right. up. And, yeah. and it is not anywhere in any NFPA standard, but somebody had to draw the line in the sand. So I said, okay, if a, if the training is taking place on a car or a two door, a four door, a, a van, a pickup truck, uh, even a dually, it's, it's less than 10,000 pound GVW rating. So chances are I'm, I'm dealing with with uh, with chapter eight common ve- passenger vehicle and I'm dealing with uh, with awareness operations or technician level. 
And then for chapter nine, it all NFPA says is heavy vehicles. So to me, that's that's the skinny Atlas school bus. That's the charter bus. That that's a, a tractor trailer truck, a dump truck. It's something heavier Heavy. than 10,000. So, so the trainers on the program for their department, they need to decide, draw your line in your, in your sand at what weight you want. And, and then just Below that is is operations or, or technician level common passenger vehicles, chapter eight. And above that it have is heavy stuff. Um trucks, buses, airplanes, and the and the like. No, no, I like that again because we're firefighters, man. And so the simpler you can make it, the better. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh so you want to dive in? I'm I'm gonna say, let me see. Extrication. Man, what I, I want to start with this, then we'll get into one thousand six a little bit. But what started your uh, interest and passion? Like, like what? This is kind of your backstory on why you're so ate up with extrication. I was always interested in 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 vehicles, uh, but then uh, in in the early seventies, uh, I was asked about uh, the air the Slim Jim hoax, which some fire departments may still use a Slim Jim. If, if they if they do, that's a dinosaur. But there was a story going around about a, a Slim Jim going down inside of a door of a car and it and it deployed the side impact airbag and, it, and the Slim Jim tool flew up and killed the police officer that was trying to open the door. Well, the whole thing was bogus. So that really locked me into, okay, somebody somebody representing fire rescue needs to stick up for this this the fake false stuff that's out there so that the slim jim hoax got me started and then at that time it was airbags so i came up with the 5 10 20 uh for airbags and at that time oh, wow. airbags didn't exist in the rear seat belts like they do now right and, and we didn't have roof airbags and we were just at the infancy so the airbags kept me going and then that transitioned into the hybrid uh, issue about 2000 with the Toyota Prius and everybody was asking about the hybrid H- how do you deal with a hybrid because they are slightly different than the conventional vehicles and then that that transitioned into the boron steel and the new the new steel the new tools and the new techniques and then now the latest requests I get the most common requests I get now are for ele- EVs electric vehicles everybody wants to know what's new and different and what's the latest on the electric vehicles so it really has been driven by the change of the industry and you trying to say someone in the fire service has to keep up with this yeah and and, and now now I got great contacts that they'll send me stories I got a guy like say in Florida he'll send me a story about something that I didn't hear about in the Dallas area so so I'm now I feel like I'm connected but then I, I wrote all those articles for Firehouse Magazine, and that wound up being a good way to get the message out every month. Um, right on. To get the message out to the to the responders. No, your network, has, especially with the time you spend in, in, in the single field, your network has to be pretty impressive. Michael Ramirez says, I wonder if Ron saw the 18-wheeler hanging over the overpass in South County, Spring, Texas, this morning. Don't know if you saw it or not, but he was. I, I haven't yet. I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, Michael. Uh, all right. Uh, Carl Avery said, known Ron for nearly 50 years now. Uh-huh. Remember talking to him in his office at the New York State Fire Academy. Yep. Back in the day. <laughs> all right. Pulling up the notes here. Uh, let's walk through 1006. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, 1006, uh, the, the focus would be on chapter eight, which is awareness, operations, or technician. The overall chapter is called common passenger vehicles. So to me, that's the car, the two door, four door cars, pickup trucks, vans, and, and, and the like. So what I what I came up with is kind of a checklist of, of skills that you can go through and and it all starts with uh, learning how to stabilize a vehicle on four wheels chapter eight also talks about a vehicle on its side chapter eight also talks about a vehicle on its roof so we we really need to be good at stabilization when I talk to a, a, a fire department and they we start talking about war stories I'll ask them what was the what would what would you say is the most frequent task that you accomplish at a vehicle rescue incident? And and typically they'll say, well, Ron, it's a it's a door job. Right. Okay, but the answer should be stabilization. 
and, and it's especially important with the hybrids uh, where they introduce the sleep mode and now with the electric vehicles. The, these are these are potentially silent killers that that weigh thousands of pounds that can move forward so stabilization should be a, a skill that that we get good at so then i ask the teams that do stabilize and say what do you do oh we just take a a halligan or a pick and we just puncture a tire i said well what do you do about run flat tires a run flat tire doesn't need air to 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 run it runs because the sidewalls are about triple thick so so well what we cut valve stems well valve stems what if it's tire pressure monitoring system well we use our step chocks okay step chocks are good but but i i have an suv that's 14 inches off the ground it's above the height of any step chocks. what do you do about high ground clearance vehicles or or what do you do if a part of your district has a prevalence for low profile tires where sure. the whole tire is only an inch thick to begin with? So so I think we really need to get good at stabilization. One of the new things that I see fire departments playing with is a car on four wheels, stabilizing it with struts. No, just the actual like using struts. Out, yeah. Right, almost like making outriggers, but that's something I don't want you to try that for the first time at a real world wreck. But if that's something you want to do to deal with, you ought to deal with it during training. That might be something to try. Stabilization is very important. No, no, and, and I think a lot of people saw the one. I think it was New York FDNY, where yeah. the 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 SUV took off while the guy was half in, half out. Right, I think he ended up right. breaking a femur, if I'm not incorrect yeah but... he he, sur he was lucky to survive that that was not necessarily an electric vehicle but that was a, a vehicle that, that that he once it started to drive away because the driver was still in the seat once he started it started to drive away on its side he he was along for the ride right unfortunately no no 100 percent. i mean no one wants to be caught in that situation obviously no, a tough situation no so stabilization is something we need to, to to work on what about run flats what about tire pressure monitoring valve stems what about high ground clearance what about low profile tires so there's what about running boards you, you buy a, a pickup truck that has either fixed running boards or, or a the, deployable running the board. fancy ones yeah so, yeah so so i would encourage you to expand your stabilization training um to make sure that that the the crew doesn't encounter a deployable running board on a pickup truck let's say for the first time at a real world incident and 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 they they figure well hey chief i can't stabilize the car over here well yes you can you you should have practiced it before Hmm. No, it's strong. All right. Pulling up my 1006 notes here. Because we got stabilizing the vehicle on four wheels. Well, the next thing that, that is a change is uh, that, that teams usually talk to me about is uh, what's, what we call a 12-volt battery. It, the manufacturers actually just refer to it as a low, low voltage. Um, I learned through General Motors uh, just this week that um, they ha they are going to pr going to produce a vehicle where the hood is permanently shut. So, yeah, so, because they say there's nothing, there's no usable parts, nothing that responders need to access in the front front area, the frunk area. So, so because I don't want crew crew members standing in front of a vehicle, I don't want you to be messing around with with the front hood latch. The better technique for forcing open a hood if the inside latch doesn't work is to get somebody by the front tire on each side and, and you simply make a make a gap, pry the hood up, cut the hinges, and use the front latch as the front hinge and you tip it forward almost like a like Corvette. a foreign sports car. But it's so it's so more much more reliable and so much quicker and it, it doesn't allow or doesn't require a firefighter to be in front of a vehicle before I can get this thing shut down. Right, right. No, I love it. I love it. Uh trunk and trunk tunneling. Trunk tunneling is something that that the crews need to do. Um, and primary the the scenario primarily is um, a, a four door, let's say a four door car that crashed under a, a a tractor trailer truck, the trailer of it. So so whether it it hit at the rear or it hit at the side, the the only access you have, uh, it, it, the sides are 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 restricted. So you you 
what you do as an officer, you stand at the rear of that vehicle and you say, I want to take this sedan and I want to make it into a, a hatchback or, or a lift gate, or I want to make it into an SUV. What's in the way? Well, obviously the back window, the back, the trunk lid, the speaker deck, the back of the back seat. So your, your end result is a, a boarded patient on the interior of the car could be loaded onto a board and brought out the back end that you just gutted open. Right. So it can be done. Uh, I do it every time I have a tractor trailer truck where we can shove a car underneath it, but you could do it with a car just sitting on its wheels. If you just put a, draw a line in the sand, in the dirt on each side and say, this is the edge of the tractor trailer truck or put you, cones there. You yeah. can't go in, you can't go forward. You only have the butt end of this car. So trunk tunneling is is a very good skill. Now, Cor Corley, there's one um, problem that one risk involved with trunk tunneling. And it's, it's if I put my key into a trunk of a typical automobile, when the trunk latch releases, the trunk lid comes up. That's because there's tension steel rods under that back speaker deck that are that are torqued, so so they release. Don't don't cut them. With okay. a, a power cutter can cut them, but it's spring steel, so the spring steel could cause a ding in the cutting edge of the blades of your cutter, which would weaken it, it at that time or weaken it future in the future. So those trunk rods, those spring steel tension rods are are. You can just pry them out or you can cut the, the sheet metal that they're attached to at the ends. But you you want crews involved in trunk tunneling to avoid cu physically cutting those rods. The springs themselves? Be, right. Yeah, because it's spring steel and it, and it, it, it has a potential to cause damage un unnecessarily. Nice, nice. Um Man, I, I'm trying to think. I've I, I've done a lot of extrication, but I'm not an expert. So I I want to. I'm looking through 1,000. The 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 list of skills. Uh, what's the next one that you think is the most important? I mean, obviously you start with stabilization. Well, one the good <clears throat> news on uh, on boron and ultra high strength steel. The good news is the door latches uh, didn't change, haven't changed for years. So you could still have a 1970 vintage power spreader. And, and use it to get a door open. The, the, the latch mechanism is still a 4,000 pound safety latch and, and the hinges can be cut or pried. It might take a little bit more effort today, but we can get the doors open. Uh, if there's boron steel in the car, it might be inside the door. It might be in a collision beam, but it's really not causing us any, any issues or any, any problems. So the good news is brand new car i can still use old school techniques to get the door open and probably get the door off the issue that next becomes i want to uh, uh, jack the dash or roll the dash which is probably a well-known technique i have some hard hard impact head-on or offset collision and that whole front end has crumpled back onto the front seat occupants so with ultra high strength steel you it it will not tear like we're used to the ultra high strength steel that's in the lower a pillar almost all of the b pillar potentially even in the c pillar it has to be completely cut so for even when you're working on a a, a 20 year old car for training you should still require your your participants to totally cut wherever they used to just make a nick in it and and tear it because on a modern day vehicle with ultra high strength steel it is less likely to tear and more likely to be completely cut through gotcha so it just it just won't rip apart like we're used to or like what we see with the cars we're available to work on correct but it does in training because the cars are 10 or 15 years old they're the junkers but it won't work today tonight out in the street because it's a 2021 or and we're, we're, we're we're reinforcing habits that will not work yep. on modern cars no i love yeah all right uh question coming at you from gus salcedo out of the metroplex area there in in a passenger vehicle versus 18 wheeler underride situation what would be your preference a Leave the vehicle in place and extricate the patient, or B, separate the passenger vehicle from the 18 wheeler and then extricate. And I know there's a lot of variables there, so, but. Yeah, and, and, and another variable would, would be related to separation would be lifting the heavy object. 
um, which a, a heavy wrecker could do or we could do potentially. My experience has been with the underrides that that the the vehicle, if the vehicle, the, the passenger vehicle hit the larger tractor trailer truck at a high rate of speed, it probably is now impaled. So it, it's not going to pull apart like you want it to. It's not going to separate like two pieces. That should always be an option. But the norm probably will be stabilizing as found and then working the vehicle up apart come the trunk tunneling for example or side doors and total sidewall removal because it probably won't pull apart like like you're you're wanting it to like you're thinking it will almost like uh moi but mechanism of injury or mechanism of impact how much of them have become intertwined so to speak yeah and i i, I would always keep moving the truck as an option but be be also careful about the emotional state of the truck driver because if the truck driver, if if they're if they were the driver that was there when the car crossed a double solid yellow line, they now may be an emotional patient, and they may not be controllable like you want. So you may want to consider per, our own personnel uh, or somebody that's not personally involved in it. If if you are going to try to move the tractor or move the heavy object, Don't, okay. Just be careful of the mental attitude of the uh, of the driver. No, all yeah, no, that's solid. Um, Kelsey Trotty says, Ron Moore, three exclamation points. The man that made me fall in love with extrication, learned so much from him, wish I still had my book I got from him. Uh, Jonah Fateg says, for a front dash displacement, does the new high strength steel make it easier to achieve more push or harder given that it provides increased resistance? It, it makes it harder if you don't do total cuts. If you do, if you, if where we used to just tear it and pry it with a ram or pry it with a spreader, if you just use your cutter to cut it completely through, it seems ridiculous. Why do I need to do this? But the boron will separate if you separated it ma manually. The other thing, Corley, that goes with the, the, the lower A pillar ultra high strength steel is the structure of the dash. The da dash or instrument panels have a, a dash support pipe it runs from the a pillar on the driver's side it goes all the way across it's like a spinal column goes all the way across the, the the dash to the passenger side so the steering column on the driver's side is bolted onto this okay this pipe the dash support pipe on the passenger side or it, it's bolted up to it on the passenger side the passenger airbag is bolted onto it the problem is the only securement points were at the a pillar on driver and passenger side so it would wiggle in the middle so uh, what they call the center tunnel the manufacturers still refer to it as a tunnel they put two at least two one or or two uh dash tie downs so if you've completely severed the the lower a pillar for example and and, and you got it ready to go up and if you can work a tool in there and sever w those tie downs you can get you could be on the driver's side rolling or jacking the dash and get travel all the way across the car to the, all the way across to the other side of the car just because of that spinal cord that you're lifting yeah be, because the, the the instrument panel might stay together but the tie downs would isolate you to a small side or if you severed the tie downs it would give you the the whole dashboard would stay stiff i got you no no so there's there, huh? yeah there's a new design technology where if you encounter an, a late model car figure your your dash jacking or dash rolling has to be modified a couple different ways total cuts instead of tears and the tie downs instead of uh instead of disregarding them no no i just i love talking to someone who is a subject matter expert because there's so much to it that 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 is fascinating when you really dig in man it really really is um back to 10 1006 um you talked about we talked about a lot of this um, your favorite, well, I, I, that's, that's so hard to ask because I don't want to say favorite, but I will say what's your favorite one to teach, like your favorite technique to teach just, just on an enjoyment factor or, or bang for the buck factor almost. I, I think it's something to do with the dash jacking or dash rolling, uh, especially if the department is on for some reason head, heads been in the sand, they're unfamiliar with that technique. When you, when you do it right and it really works well, it, it is an impressive technique, but it does have to be done right. There are so many little intricacies, intricacies to it. 
No, I like it. Um, total well, roof. We, we no. used to teach. We used to teach a technique uh, call, uh, that we we called or is referred to as total B pillar, total total sidewall removal, total blowout. That is one technique now that that departments are familiar with. That's a technique that probably won't work like it like it does on the junker. That's one technique that has become a dinosaur. And you're talking about like the go wing where you just like just take well, the yeah, whole side well, off. It, yeah, you, it's a it's a four door car and you have one whole the front door, the B pillar, and the rear door on that side all stay together as one giant wing. And that's one technique that just has become a dinosaur because of the ultra high strength steels. It's just become obsolete. Yeah, we're actually in the same amount of time on a modern day vehicle, open the front door and remove it, open the rear door and remove it, and then attack the B pillar, three separate items, you'll actually get the work done quicker on a modern car than the total sidewall removal. Or oh, wow. No, because I mean, I'm, I'm, that's one of the techniques I'm, I'm familiar and comfortable with, and I didn't know I was operating with a dinosaur, so. It's good to know. It really is. Uh, Nate Sturm says, can you talk about the use of your opinion on reciprocating saws versus boron rods? Do you recommend or go another route? So I, I did a, a couple of tests now. The, the most recent one was a couple months ago with a reciprocating saw. I, I, I used a corded reciprocating saw. I think it was like a 11 amp. So it has some beef to it. It should be a variable speed. It should have an adjustable shoe on it. So what I did is I went to, uh, here in Plano, I went to the Lowe's store and, and bought Bosch blades and any, and I bought $100 worth of Recipsol blades from between uh, Elliott, uh, Ace Hardware, uh, Home Depot, and Lowe's. And, and of, of 10 different types of blades with this powerful saw, I was able to, to get four of them that actually were effective in cutting the boron. So uh, I've been to departments that have, well, we have Hearst tools. And, and, and what do you do if, if Hearst tool number one fails? Well, we have four of them on the rig. Okay. Do you have a backup? So for the average fire department, I would say your backup could be or should be, uh, no matter what you have for your frontline boron steel attack, make sure you have at least a corded recip saw with, with a, a boron capable, like a Diablo blade that can go through it. It's gonna, it's gonna take a lot of, lot of more work. It's gonna take a lot more time, but you, you really need to have, recip saw is a, is a good backup to cutting boron. Now, I want to ask on your, and I know you just did this research, but uh, was it certain brands that were very good? I don't want to say very good, like you're endorsing yeah. them, but certain brands that were better, or was it a a, uh, a lack of consistency between the same brand? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, no, the the, the, the winner that we have always had, and, and the winner that is known throughout the fire service is Diablo, uh, which is only sold at, like at Home Depot. They are an expensive blade. So uh, ironically, I had a, a blade from Bosch uh, that was designed for stainless steel that I bought at Lowe's. And the, the Diablo sales rep for this state came to my home afterwards to look at the results. And, and, and next thing I know, I hear him on, his, on the phone to the bo his boss in, in, uh, in Atlanta. And it turns out Bosch owns Diablo. Oh, so the, the the Bosch blade was about half the price. It was designed it was designed and sold in Europe initially, and it was a, a good performer. There was a couple of Bozo blades that that are designed that that are mild steel and not have never been changed or never been upgraded by the blade manufacturer. They they have a lot of marketing, but they just have never addressed the ultra high strength. So Diablo re remained from years ago and remained recently the, like the top dog. Okay. No, and it's easy to remember. Again, I love stuff that firefighters can lock in their brain. Diablo. Yeah, uh, the devil. Yeah, the devil, man. If you want to cut more on steel, there where you're going. Robert Ramirez, my man, South Florida, says, when accessible or identifiable, the radio straps or tie-downs are a great contingency cut plan to create more space or get more rise. Now, that's a little Greek to me, but does that make sense to you? No, it, it, and what you should do is, what, what he's talking about is the dash tie downs, or it could be one of them or two of them that are holding the center of that dash support pipe. 
So if if while a crew is working the exterior of the car, let's say the lower A or, or where, whatever they're doing outside to prepare for, if you can get somebody, even if they have to squeeze between the bucket seats, if you can get somebody to, to use a, a long blade recip saw or an air chisel or something just to cut those tie downs, it will make a huge, it's a huge benefit. It will make a huge difference to your results. Gotcha. So right back to that spinal cord. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's just okay. knowing a little bit about the technology, about the design, and about the features of it. Love it, love it. Keep the questions coming, man. Ron is killing it. Pulling up my electric one vehicles, Corley. Um, on electric vehicles, the ultra high strength steel is now essentially across the board on any electric vehicle. Tesla, all all four of the Teslas, Ford. Kia, the, the, the ultra high strength steel is there. So if you don't have the capability and don't have the knowledge to deal with ultra high strength steel, it is already in your neighborhood. No, oh, without a doubt. Uh, Christopher Armager says, Chief Ike just went to the UK and did some high pressure work. Are we getting closer to disassembling for extrication versus dismantling? Should we start practicing with impact drills instead of cutters and spreaders yet? What's your thoughts? Um, treat, treat a, an entrapment like a banana. You want you want to learn how to peel the skin away from the banana to get to the core. You want to learn how to take away the parts of the car to get to the patients. So if, if it involves uh, physically cutting and removing, that's your technique. You go with it. If it involves unbolting or disassembly, that's a technique. Uh, the, the heavier vehicles, which is chapter nine, uh, the heavy vehicles disassembly is mentioned several times as a very viable technique because the the metal may be so heavy and so physically strong that disassembly winds up being a key uh, ta tactic for you to use. So so you're peeling the skin off this banana to try to get to the core. You're removing the car that's obstructing getting the patient out. So it really comes down to your 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 scene size up. I hate to say that, but th your assessment of what you're dealing with. Is disassembly going to be faster or destruction? Right. Right on. Right. No, exactly. I like also, it. Also, what you want to do is you don't want to walk up with a tool in your hand and say, what can I do with this tool? It should be you, it should be you walking up to the car. What do I need? I need this done. I need this done. Okay, now what tools do I have within my resources to accomplish that task? So we shouldn't be some tool dependent. We should be task dependent I and then do. what tools will solve the, the, those tasks no it's maslow's hammer which is if you have a hammer every problem looks like a nail yeah and so yeah 100 well, percent. it makes complete sense i love it uh okay now you you brought up electric vehicles so this brings me to let me, let me get my notes hold on my uh vigilante question of the week the vigilantes of course is the private group that you can belong to if you go to firehousevigilance.com always like to make a plug for it but this one comes from craig d blake who was making comments in here earlier, but uh, it's an electric vehicle question, so I wanted to segue to it. And I, uh, he said, based on the recent electric vehicle fires in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian and documented rekindle events after EV fire extinguishment across the U.S., do you see changes in operational doctrine for EV fires evolving away from water extinguishment? So long, long winded question, but I wanted yeah. to throw it at you and then we can talk about EV fires and what you're seeing and all your thoughts on it. Well, it's, it's very, it's a very common uh, or very current topic, uh, fire suppression. The problem has been identified for years. It didn't take the salt water in Florida to identify it, although that just exact exasperated it. The problem is uh, we had an incident north of Houston in, in Spring, Texas, where they knocked a fire down with 500 gallon booster tank. They knocked a fire down, but they used 28,000 gallons of water to, to eventually get this fire to, to stop rekindling. We had an incident, <laughs> excuse me, outside of Philadelphia where they used 23,000 gallons of water. If you if you contact NFPA right now, they'll talk about three. 3,000 gallons of water. It's it's the rekindle, it's the lithium ion that will go out but play possum and will lay dormant for five seconds or up to three weeks for that matter. Wow. So so um, the the latest techniques are, are, are the problem are these are floor pan mounted batteries and the the GM the GM Hummer EV is out now with almost a 3,000 pound 
uh, uh, lithium ion battery. So the problem is if the lithium ion battery cells begin what's called the thermal runaway the process, runaway, right. begin to misbehave, they're in a metal footlocker. They're in a metal box, and we actually don't have direct access to what's burning. So a couple of the, a couple of things we're still the fire service across the North America is still experimenting. A couple of things that have come up is um, tilting and cooling. So so for example, Santa Clara Ca County, California, they 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 knock the fire down, they tilt the car slightly, and then they get a, a cooling water spray on the undercarriage, which is the bottom of the battery compartment. And they'll use that in conjunction with a thermal imager. And when the temperature goes below about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, then they'll move the water spray to another area. So, so it's these copious amounts, flooding amount, cooling amounts of water that are going to be required. So it really is a, a dilemma because then you get the same fire department that says, I don't have 23,000, I don't even have 3,000 gallons out on the interstate. Right. So, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, then you get the fire officer that says, I'm just going to let it burn. Well, if you're going to let it burn, it'll take about three hours. We've had shrapnel go up to 100 feet in, in all directions. So the, the road has to be closed and it, it is going to damage what it's sitting on the concrete or the blacktop. Something is going to be damaged and, and the road law enforcement, the tow operator, traffic management, everybody needs to be involved in it. This is now this car fire that was in, in the old days was 30 minutes over and done with is now three hours plus five agencies right yeah, yeah with all these agencies so the social media side of it will, will kill you well no wonder the firefighters didn't didn't uh no wonder i was held up in traffic when i finally got home two hours later it was because when i went by the firefighters were just standing by well, standing watching it burn yeah you watching it burn you're it's like kind of like a hazmat incident but you don't want to have to explain it to every motorist but so so i just did a program for fire department and tow operators uh in, north of fort worth and the the tow operator that covers 22 volunteer fire departments he said he he had an electric vehicle at his tow yard that for five days sizzled and burped and gurgled and made all kinds of sounds. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to solve that in the future. He's going to have a pit that he will park the car, the electric car in if the lithium ion battery is damaged, he'll park it in this pit and then allow it's, it's water. It's, it's a tile line. So it's going to be able to be flooding up to an over the level of the battery. So that so so uh, uh, Mitsubishi <laughs> is the only manufacturer that said you can flood the battery, but Mitsubishi, who put in writing, flooding is okay. They said it would have to remain submerged in water for three and a half days. Oh, well, wow. you could do that in, in a tow yard, but not out on the highway. Not on the side of the highway, right? <laughs> and I always like to tell people, because I love this, uh, you know, it's something I didn't understand, and a lot of people may already know this, and I'm not, again, an expert, but I love the skateboard analogy of, of how they build these things with hundreds of cells, thousands in some cases, but a lot of cells, and it's like a skateboard deck with the wheels underneath, and that's what you're trying to get to and cool. So that tilt-up technique you were talking about earlier, that's why it can be effective, especially when combined with a thermal imager. Uh, and again, like Ron says, we're still figuring out the future of the electric vehicle firefighting. Also, Corley, in 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 Europe, there are uh, there are manufacturers that are coming up with products to try to try to sell to us here in North America. One is a a unit that you slide underneath the car, charge it with air. There's a piercing bayonet that goes up and punctures into the battery box then you flow water like an inch and a half or inch and three quarter hose line flow water and, and well, but the problem when you talk to the manufacturers they all say very adamantly don't do anything that punctures the Pierces, battery right box. right because who knows where you're going to puncture right into the main bus bar or whatever there's so, a there's another company from uh europe that sells a tool that is like a uh, like a lance and 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 you hold it through the door window, and, and another person, a rookie, beats it with a pulp until <laughs> it punctures the, the floor pan, punctures the top of the battery box, and then it it has a water jet connected to it. 
So that that isn't even um, recommended uh, well, and, by, and, the, and, by the manufacturers. And my question is, how effective? I mean, how how important is stream placement on which cells are doing the thermal runaway at the right. time? Because if you're right. not in the right, I don't know. I don't know the actual physical layout on that skateboard deck, but if you don't get close to where the thermal runaway is happening, are you even accomplishing anything with a piercing uh, nozzle approach? And I don't know. Main, I don't know. It's my ignorance speaking. I'm right, just asking. And, and it's, it's against all of the directions from all of the manufacturers. Don't do anything that punctures or cuts into or tears open the battery box. So if you do it, somebody is going to say, do you realize the manufacturer of that battery or that vehicle said not to? So, right. so you're, you're kind of, you and everybody at the scene, as well as your organization are hung out to dry. All right. I want to throw this at you because I'm kind of switching topics on you, uh, right midstream of electric vehicle. But this guy asked the question, Josh Schlegel asked the question uh, earlier and I didn't get to it. Are air chisels still viable tool in vehicle extrication? Yes, except particularly like at a school bus rescue if somebody is at the back of the school bus using an air chisel it is it is such a noisy tool that you might want to learn you learn to use it in short spurts because during the use of a noisy tool such as the air chisel uh, you you the medic can't communicate with it what was originally a calm patient up front so i i notice it a lot in school buses I, so if, if you are training with it, if that's what you want to work with, you can do great jobs. It is just a very, very noisy tool and make sure you maybe want to train in, to use it in spurts. It's almost like around the noising. when you're trying to stress out rookies and put them through something, you add a whole bunch of noisy tools in the area, loud music, et cetera. That would it's do all, it. It's almost a stress factor adding. Yeah, I get it. Uh, Robert Ramirez says <coughs> the dot, DOT, I should say, the DOT percentage of electrical vehicles on U.S. roadways is believed to be just over 1%. As that number inevitably increases over the next decade, the fire service is going to have to play catch up if we don't get ahead of it as an industry. And I thought that was a great comment on, on where we're basically what this conversation is about. Yeah. And, and the, for example, um, the automakers are already looking at the next chemistry for Ba uh, high voltage batteries, something that is less um, volatile than lithium ion. So let's say, let's say next uh, with 2023, just pretend for a moment they automatically all all switched away from lithium ion. We, the fire service, would still have lithium ion batteries for another 10 years, just right. the, the leftover. So we are always playing catch up, even when the technology goes on. We're always playing catch up. Uh, John K. Johnson says, Ron, talk about the fire blanket. So, so with the fire blanket, which is a, a, a product that's being commercially available and being marketed, one of the problems with the fire blanket that we've experienced already is it's, it's, a, it's a tarp. You can use it. It's like $8,000. You can use it a couple of times. The problem is lithium ion cells generate their own oxygen. So the, the blanket is like a giant tarp that you would you let the car sit for an hour with, with this tarp around it and it, it suffocates the fire well it works for an internal combustion engine with ordinary combustibles but it might not be as effective for lithium iron wh where it generates its own oxygen plus if you use the fire blanket which which departments could i mean it, it, they could purchase it if you use the fire blanket the instructions say to leave it blanketed for one hour so, so now your, your, your car is smoking and off gassing and, and the road is closed and your crew is, ex, is there for an extended duration of time. Mm -hmm. Standing around with what is exceptionally a, a, a car cover while yeah. people drive by wondering what the hell's going a on. A reusable, a reusable blanket, but it, it is a commercially available product. Uh, Nate Stern wants to know, we always debate this at our department. What are your thoughts on leaving the tires inflated or deflating them after stabilization during vehicle extrications? Uh, uh, one, of, one of the things, I, I could go either way. If a team deflates tires, they should be trying to take the load off the suspension. So there should already, prior to any deflation work, there should have been cribbing or step shock, something applied underneath. You, you, you're trying to relax the suspension system. Now, uh, leaving the tires inflated would work. It, again, there still would be step shocks or cribbing under the car. 
one of the tech one of the rescue techniques that I teach now is how to properly and slightly lift the vehicle so your partner can slide the cribbing or step chalk, say under the A pillar or under the C pillar. There is a way to actually lift it where you wouldn't have to deflate the tires at all. Where I run into that the most is when the tow truck guys say, I hate when the fire department's at a crash scene, I always have flat tires. Okay, well, you're the tow truck guy, you should have a rollback, you should be getting this car <laughs> up on, it doesn't matter if there's air in the tires or not. So, so there is a way for the fire service to to deflate tires or leave them inflated, but cribbing support on the structure of the vehicle is the key. Dude, I love it. I love it. And John K. Johnson wraps up what I said. He said, thanks, brother Ron. JJ, so, yeah. <laughs> no, 100%, man. There's some good stuff coming here. Uh, no, you covered that. Eye on blank. Yes. All right, brother. Getting my notes back up here. Had the vigilante question of the week. Uh, is, do you think, and this is another part of Craig D. Blake's question, uh, from the vigilante questions of the week. He said, is there any pressure on vehicle manufacturers to add more guidance in their emergency response guides? Have you seen that or are they responsive or what's your, what's your uh, thoughts on it? Yeah, there, there is pressure if you want to call it that. Uh, but, it, but it isn't required pressure. So the manufacturers are trying to deal with the, the, how, how, how better, what better could they say? How could they recommend improvements in our firefighting? Because they don't want the bad publicity. Right. But there is no requirement that they have to experiment or have to tell us how actually to deal with their, their vehicle. So until there is requirement, we're not getting solid information. They're getting information because they're trying to address news media type, social media type uh, pub bad publicity. So if I forced you into a box and said, play Nostradamus and predict the future. Okay. And I know that's a very open. Do you see a, do you see like, is it, is submersion going to be a deal? Is it going to be portable tanks? Um, what, what, where do you think it's going? Or do you think technology is going to catch up and, and we're just going to be playing catch up? There's going to have to be a, a, a way, whether it's a tool or a technique, I don't know. There's going to have to be something comes about that we take the, the burning, the, the, the thermal runaway uh, cells that are inside this metal footlocker box, and we somehow uh, uh, cool them. General Motors has a new battery, a uh, high voltage battery called the Altium, and they're telling firefighters we, that that the vehicle, if as long as the 12 volt system is still intact, they have designed a way internally that the battery will deal with its own fault will deal with its own thermal runaway. That may be a, a, a new evolving technology as well. But in the meantime, we, we don't have 20, 23 or 28,000 gallons of water to, to, to cool a vehicle out in, in the interstate. Right, right. No, 100%, man. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how it plays out over time. Science is amazing and firefighters are amazing. That's the two things I know. And uh, no matter what the challenges that have been thrown, we've always managed to figure it out. Yep. All right. Um, I love to ask this question. Uh, book or books that you think firefighters should be reading? doesn't have to be fire service related, and it can absolutely be fire service related, but I always like to ask, what books do you think firefighters should be reading? I subscribe to a bunch of magazines. A lot of them are free. Uh, free subscriptions. They're, they're, they're like sponsored magazines. So there are, there are, uh, one is called um, Charged, char Charged, and that, that is a, a good uh, magazine that I get a couple times a year. I okay. think there's like four times a year, and it's all about electric vehicles. So, and, and there's a lot of, Corley, I think rather than, than documents, there's a lot of online stuff that you right. can check up that that's where the rabbit holes come up <laughs> because you follow one story and, and follow another story. But um, so, so it really is an uphill struggle to keep up to date and keep involved. I don't know that there's any book out there per se. Uh, our techniques, fortunately, 2012 to 2017, we, we really did a lot of work with techniques and those techniques, other than dealing with the boron steel, those techniques are holding and performing well so it, it's nice to see we've almost stabilized with our our ways to get people out what's what's changing still that that we have to keep up with is the evolving technology 
the, beautiful. the electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, tr vehicles that are plugged into charging stations, that kind of stuff. Right. And we didn't even touch on like, like stationary charging stations and the, and the challenges of that. So I love it. <clears throat> yeah, it's real, it's real easy on the, on the public charging stations. Uh, you, if, if you get a call to one of those where the vehicle's plugged in and on fire, uh, you, you treat it like wires down there. They all are, are, uh, uh, AC alternating current AC feeds. Then they become DC within the, the electric vehicle itself. So, so it's wires down, it wires down, you quarantine the area, you request a utility company to shut down the power, and then you go in and, and deal with the problem. So, so the, uh, the, the, the public charging stations are, uh, are easy to deal with. What's going to be where most of the electric vehicle charging has taken place is in person's home in their driveway or in their garage. And right. That's gonna, and, and now Ford is making a big deal. They're just one of them making a big deal about buy chargeable. So in the event of a power failure, the battery of my F-150 lightning pickup truck will recharge. Backfeed the house. Yeah. Backfeed the house. Yeah. So, so now you have the utility company come and kill the power at the structure fire, but yet the lights stay on. Uh, it's because the, the plugged in, truck or car is in the, the ford lightning is is yeah keeping yeah. everything you got hit by lightning all right <laughs> <laughs> um i want to throw this at you because uh carl avery ask any problems with runoff from cooling water on ev fires is, is that an issue yet or is has, has anybody done research on it the further <clears throat> it, it is an issue the runoff the further west you go the more uh, they treat it as hazardous material the bottom line for for most of us is the runoff is no worse than it has been with a conventional internal combustion vehicle. What is different in a in an electric vehicle fire is the smoke. If if it's there's a, a stage where it just gives off clouds of white or brown or black smoke, it, it that is a very toxic uh, smoke hydrogen uh, fluoride. So that's a very top toxic smoke that that. If the vehicle firefighting goes on for more than 20 minutes, chances are you need you need another crew, you need a RIT team to come in because your SCBA won't last that long. So mm. rather than have a, a firefighter just not wear a mask, an electric vehicle fire, uh, we're, I don't want him to wear a mask. And then when the bell goes off, he still has firefighting. He takes the mask off and ditches it. Well, you're you're going to really be exposed to some bad stuff. So the off gassing has turned out to be more lethal or more hazardous than than the water runoff. Than the runoff, okay. Yeah, the incident in uh, outside of Philadelphia, Lower Marion Township, the chief told me he said, you know, Ron, when we when we were fighting the fire, the guys kept slipping and sliding. Turns out when they finally turned on all the floodlights, the battery box had burst open and they were walking on the battery cells or like double A batteries. They were like ball bearings under their feet. Oh, wow. So, wow. so that was a unique situation, but that just shows you that there is, there are concerns with the runoff. Sure. No, no, absolutely. But more concerns with the off gas. Yeah. The off gassing is, is, is bad and it's part of what they call thermal runaway it's equivalent of lighting a waste basket and it goes to flash over thermal runaway are are the individual uh high voltage cells one misbehaves it dominoes to the next one it dominoes to the next one and now that whole lunchbox size pack is is uh, is causing a problem um so the heat signature is one common denominator the cop copious amounts of water is another common denominator but we really don't have a, a final solution yet Other than right. don't pierce it <laughs> don't don't stab it uh yeah. i like this question it comes from rob ramirez he was asking this and i wanted to th I, I i keep getting good questions coming so i have to throw them at you but rob says what is ron's approach or mindset when creating a plan a plan b or emergency plan for an extrication after your initial size up it's kind of your your walk through on walking up on it Okay, so um, so the the process would be to stabilize the vehicle, whether it's internal combustion or electric vehicle or a hybrid. It could be completely quiet, but completely energized. So I need to prevent 
movement forward, backward, side to side, up and down. So I got it stabilized. I need to come up with a technique for access. Access may be using a, a door that's already opened or, or breaking a window to get in. Uh, so so I, I, after I stabilize it, I need to get access into it. And then what what is it inside that's trapping the, the patient? Probably it's going to be door door opening, door removal, or door widening. And, and then one of the last things I would think about if, if you're involved in extrication would be the, the airbag <clears throat> system. Um, the airbags, you need to shut down the 12-volt power. So they talk about um, with 12-volt shutdown, they talk about you can disconnect first to take away the ground, but also take away the hot. Or if you're, if you're technique or your department policy is to cut cables you want to double cut so so if you have a firefighter assigned to the battery they're at the the, the one let's say 12 volt battery that's in the vehicle and they have decided they're going to cut the cables they need to t double cut it to take a chunk out of it right on right on love it there you go uh jeffrey steven says ron plano 4b is listening so <laughs> just so you know i figured that means something my guys awesome man uh, I love, I, I do have a lot of, uh, love for Plano. Yeah. Uh, I just came back from there last week. Oh, uh, wow. Got to teach at their ODP and be involved with, uh, some of them. So I, I do have a lot of love for them. Yeah, cool. Uh, now I have a thing that goes on in the scrap. It's called the next five questions for firefighters. It used to be called the five questions for firefighters, but after a hundred episodes, we had to change it up because you know, all the low hanging fruit had been, had been plucked. So the next five, and, and we're getting there on the next five questions, to be honest, but long story short, the uh, questions are, uh, the questions, the answers are completely your opinion. There is no right or wrong. And the points are arbitrary assigned by me and the, the uh, audience. So my question for you is Ron Moore, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Sure. All right, here we go. <laughs> Number one, what single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier go-to badass firefighter? The fact that the situation that firefighter encounters, they've already experienced it in training. If you can experience it in training, you're, re you're better prepared to deal with the real world. Ooh, I like that. You know, you know why I like the answer? Is, and I'm, I'm being serious here because most people say like motivation or grit or determination. But what you're talking about is the preparation, which is completely controllable. Man, I do love that answer. The you real see? world should be a repeat of experiences already gained through training. Ooh, I really like the concept because everybody can be a top tier go to badass firefighter if you're willing to put in the training. Yep. Ooh, I like that. That's max points 100 percent. And that's an easy one. I mean, that really is an easy max points. All right. <clears throat> Number two, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? When I originally attended my first training programs, I had a little uh, notebook, a little spiral bound notebook that fit in my shirt pocket. Nice. I thought at that time that everything I needed to know about the fire service would fit in that book. <laughs> and, and that book would fit in my shirt pocket how wrong I was. It's an, it, it's a lifelong endeavor. If you really want to get into it. Dude, I love it. I'm just, I'm grabbing this right here. I keep these. Uh, I had to grab one cause I keep them right here. These little things. Yeah. 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 I keep these. I filled, it, I filled it up real quick. That I have to label them. Like school. usually they last me about six months, but I, I put all my, my genius thoughts in these, but anyway, there's not that many genius thoughts, but no. I, I love that. I love that. So because you use a spiral bound, notebook that would fit in your pocket you get max points for number two number three <laughs> what is your favorite training drill i i think it's uh the the participants are not allowed to see the the situation and it's a drill that is realistic within their capability so they they walk around to it they walk out to it they they have the ability they have the knowledge they have the competence competencies to accomplish it they just you just as a, as a trainer, you just need to see them put it all together. Mm. Dude, I can tell you've been doing this a while. This is really, really solid stuff, brother. I, I know that I give out max points like candy, but that that is a solid answer. Uh, so four for four on max points. Final question. Heavy fire. There's no, 
There's no extrication involved in this question, so we're going heavy fire and searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on a VES? Hmm. I would do the VES. Any explanation or just you want the VES? Um, it, it's, it's probably where you can really make the most difference. Uh, but I, I, I think I would just go with the VES. No, I, that's my answer it, every time. I love... V, it's V-E-E. -E. Uh, isn't there like... You can add as many as you want, apparently. Yeah. According yeah. to the Modern Fire Service, you can add as many letters as you need. But <laughs> uh, window-based search. Uh, but no, that's my answer. And you, there's no explanation needed. I just wanted to kind of dig into it a little bit, man. Uh, yeah. Jonah Fatigue said, Ron found the five question cheat codes. That's one of the most accurate statements of the evening because you absolutely crushed the five questions, sir. Right. Five for five, max points. And some of those answers I've never heard. Like usually I get a version that I've heard before, but brother, that was very, very solid, man. Um, Ted Fritzer said, so crazy how the wisdom just flows from this man. Thanks you. And this is it. Um, I love extrication is not my thing. And I'm not saying that like it's not important or anything. But when you have someone in who, who is absolutely a subject matter expert, and I don't throw that term around lightly, it is a pleasure to talk to. Because no matter what questions they threw at you, dude, you were you were just hitting dingers and knocking home runs out. Well, I appreciate so, that. Thank you. I can't say thank you enough for being a part of Weekly Scrap number 166, giving me your evening and being a part of it, man. It's been, and with your answers, that officially makes it 166 scraps in the books. Thank you, Ron Moore. Right, if someone, buddy. if someone wants to get a hold of you, reach out to you, uh, just get in touch with you for some way, shape or form. What's the best way to do so? The email works, uh, uh, rmore at fastmail.us. That, that works. It comes in as an email and then probably within a day I can get back to them. Solid. All right. Housekeeping. Finally wrapping it up. The vigilantes are getting after it, man. If you are not a part of the vigilantes, go to firehousevigilance.com. You can sign up and be a part. We do a forum once a month. Ron Moore, in fact, was our first guest at the vigilantes. And so that's why he's here now. Uh, but he came in and talked about electric vehicle fires and it was a lot of fun. And, uh, but we're getting ready to have our sixth forum, which is crazy because we only do them once a month. And I can't believe we've already been doing it for half a year. So if you want to be a part of that, go to firehousevigilance.com. Uh, this next month we're, we're discussing a, a podcast from refined by fire where Shannon stone comes on and talks leadership and we're going to pick that apart. So it's going to be a blast. Um, let me keep on reading. Uh, the scraps killer lineup continues for 2022. John Spear is next week. Fit to fight fire followed by Sean Duffy of build your culture and, uh, or yeah. And then Joe Yaller, uh, South Carolina. I'm excited to say, um, Man, the scrap is killing it. From Ron Moore to Joe Yaller and everything in between, it's been an unbelievable 2022. New way to get stickers, okay? You can still rate the podcast and get stickers and send me screenshots. But if you rate the book, the nine L's, I don't have, I should have had a copy here to hold up. The nine L's of leadership, Corley Moore, go rate it on Amazon. Give it five stars. Don't give me four. Don't give me three because that don't give you <laughs> stickers. <laughs> Please don't send me screenshots of your one-star reviews. But if you give me a, a five-star review, I will absolutely bribe you with stickers. So do so. And I will send them to you. Uh, and then you can put them on your Yetis and your coolers and your fridges and everywhere they need to be. Um, that's everything. If you know anybody that wants to sponsor the scrap, reach out just like key hose, uh, affordable drill towers, speed And who am I leaving out? Corley? Don't do that. Affordable stand. Oh, I got them all. Yeah. Next row. I love next row. All right. Um, my brother, Ron Moore, thank you for giving me right. your evening and being such a phenomenal guest. Audience, you are the ones that make the scrap magical. I really do appreciate all of the great questions. You are the ones that, without you, the scrap would not exist. So, with all that being said, I hope the tones stay silent. Unless it's burning, everybody stay safe out there. Thanks, Corley.